I don't know about you, but I believe the Lord has will not allow us to be defeated. Hallelujah. Glory. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. And because God is the greatest power, say so we shall never, never be defeated. And because God, He's the greatest power, say so we shall never, never be defeated. Say so I shall rise. I shall be, I shall go in victory, no weapon formed against me will ever overtake me, and because God is the greatest power.
you. Praise the Lord. Happy July 11th. Pastor G here, Freedom Church. I pray that your life is intrinsically blessed, uh, that the Spirit of God is resting on your life, on your family, on your loved ones, on your career, on everything that you touch. I pray that you're prospering in all things and that you are in health even as your soul prospers. I tell you, as we come out of the first week of the seventh month of our Gregarian calendar, we're in July, the number seven. Seventh month is the number of completion. And things are being released prophetically in the atmosphere that God wants you to grasp. Uh, I, I, I'm praying with you. I'm praying for you. There's been a word that's been burning in my spirit for a good little minute, and I want to release this to you. The, the, the praise and worship song said, when we cry out, we know that you hear us. When we cry out, we make our request known. When we cry out, you answer by fire. When we cry out, your glory is shown. Those words to me are more than, 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 than lyrics to a song. I believe it's a prophetic um, utterance, a prophetic disposition that we have when we approach God. And I want to pray before we get into the word today, knowing that when we cry out, God hears us. Knowing that when we cry out, we make our requests known. When we cry out, we know that he hears us and that his glory is shown. Just lift your hands where you are right now. Come on, just settle your household. Settle your living room. Settle your wherever, wherever you are. Just settle your atmosphere. And, and, and just lift your hands and, and just say these words with me. Say, God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we know that no matter how far we are from you or how near we are to you, that when we cry out, your presence, your glory, our petitions are before you. Father, bless this word today. Bless it in such a way, God, that the hearers would receive, that it would be medicine and ministry to their minds. We ask it all in your son Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. Amen. I want you to be sure that you join us. Amen. On every first and third Sundays, in-person worship, Starting in August, I'm super excited about our in-person services, first and third. We have so much to offer. Stay tuned for what God is going to be doing. Um, I'm, 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 I'm church tripping today. I'm, I'm church tripping. Um, I'm church tripping with y'all today. I'm, I'm going in on church mess. In... The 60s, the Bloods and the Crips began to rise and form power. Uh, the initial motive and mission of uh, the Crip gangs was neighborhood protection. Even the Piru Bloods, it was unity, it was neighborhood protection. And as the gangs evolved, they began to set trip. Um, the Bloods, the Pyrus represent the red bandana. The Crips, depending on which set you from, rock the blue bandana. Some rock brown. You had some rock purple, your Grape Street. You had your Bounty Hunter Bloods. You had your Inglewood Family Crips. You had just, you know, Grape Street, Watts, all of that there. But they coined the term set tripping. I'm going in today on church tripping. Um, set tripping was about beefing over 
you know, feuding over, gang banging over hood drama, hood mess, uh, top five set tripping issues in the hood was probably turf territory, you know, gang affiliation, dope, money, women. We could, we, could, we could write a bio about you by asking you one question. What set you claimed? What set you claimed told everything about where you was from, what neighborhood you was from, what the family structure was like in that neighborhood, most likely, uh, how you grew up, who was your influences, who was the hitters in your neighborhood, who was the OGs. So what, what, what set you from? What set you claimed? was an introduction, even if you did not bang, it was an introduction into set tripping, gang banging. In this series over the next few weeks, I want to talk about church tripping. Church tripping, uh, dealing with Christians who just like gang bangers can be found beefing, feuding, banging, shots fired over church mess, over church drama, over church foolishness, like what denomination you belong to, what doctrine you believe, what was your religious experience, who hurt you in church, what your church is doing, what your church ain't doing, who your pastor, oh, I know your pastor, I like your pastor, I don't like your pastor, who made you an apostle? Who ordained you? Church tripping. I believe the top five issues around church tripping deal with money in the church. Come on, y'all, talk real to me. Who, who, who handling the money? What they doing with the money? Why they always talking about money? Now they done changed. They used to be about ministry. Now they all about money. Church tripping. I believe probably one of the second greatest issues we trip out over in church is fake preachers, false prophets. Come on, somebody. Number three, hypocrisy and immorality. I can't believe the church is supposed to be this, but instead they're doing that. I can't believe... The sin is in the choir. I can't believe the preacher sleeping with the women. I can't believe they cussed. I can't believe I went to somebody church member house and they was drinking and smoking weed. I can't believe that they're hypocrites. Church tripping. And then lastly, one that I believe many of us have at one time either known somebody who experienced this or we ourselves experienced this, and that's church hurt. Church tripping. Money in the church, false prophets, fake preachers, hypocrisy and immorality and church hurt. I hope to break these down over the next few weeks. I really believe that the enemy is using church tripping to keep a lot of people away from the comfort, the safety, the power, the presence of the house of God, that being the church. How many know that COVID exposed a lot about the church? Uh, COVID exposed so much about the church. Um, it exposed the star church, the church that had it going on. It was online. They had television ministry. And all COVID did was lower their annual budget. They didn't have nobody coming to church, so they didn't have no light bill. Didn't have nobody coming and using the water, so the water bill went down, and they were already virtual. They were already online. That's the star church. COVID also exposed the steady church. They didn't have it all together, but through COVID, they were steady. They made it. They adjusted. They tweaked. They managed, and they stayed steady. COVID then exposed the struggling church. Yeah, you had the star church, the steady church, then you had the struggling church, the one that didn't have no cameras, barely had online giving. COVID exposed a lot about the church. Not only did, did it have the struggling church, it exposed the stuck church, the church that then and to this day could not get 
unstuck due to tradition, a lack of technology, inability, unwillingness to change. COVID exposed a lot about the church. Somebody type in the comments, church tripping. We church tripping today. But COVID just didn't expose the church. COVID also exposed Christians. <laughs> COVID exposed church sons, the ones that were really true in the house. Somebody type in the comments, church sons. Sons and daughters, inner circle folk, the Peter, James, and Johns, those who say, Jesus, you the only way. Where would we go without you? You remember in John 6 when he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can have no parts of me and the mass is left. And Jesus turned, Aisha, and he said, will you also leave me too? But those Peter, James, and John, those, those, those church sons, that inner circle, they said, Rabbi, you, you got the answers to if a man dies, will he live again? Where, listen, if we ain't with you, where will we go? Church exposed, or COVID rather, exposed true church sons. The ones that stayed with Jesus irregardless. But guess what? COVID also exposed the church disciples. That's just the 12. Come on, them the ones, we with you, Jesus, but we a little screwy. We might say something slow. We might do something off kilter. We might be a little bit throwed off, but we with you. We might be a little shaky every now and then, but we with you. We might doubt. We might deny, but Jesus, we with you. Yeah, COVID exposed the church sons, COVID exposed the church disciples, and COVID exposed the church attenders. That's the 120. Y'all remember the 120? They were the ones that came around when Jesus was teaching, but they wouldn't come close. They was the ones, yeah, that, that came to hear a word and came to receive, but they really didn't come to give. They really didn't come to serve. They really didn't come to sell out. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Oh, COVID exposed not just the church sons and the church disciples and the church attenders, but COVID put the spotlight on Aisha, the church skeptics. Them was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones who always were connected but looking for a reason to blame. COVID really exposed the folk in the church. I'm church tripping already. Y'all can go ahead and type amen. And if you can't type amen, just type hey, man, in the comments. Yeah, the church skeptics were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They really weren't connected. Uh, they, they were just waiting for one reason to disconnect. They just needed one reason. And you got folk in the church. I'm church tripping tonight. I'm church tripping today. I'm church tripping these next couple of weeks. They just needed one reason to disconnect. They really wasn't faithful. And church, the COVID exposed the church skeptics. The times that we're in call for a change. I'm preaching apostolically and prophetically today because I strongly, I strongly sense I'm praying for pastors right now. I'm praying for church leaders right now. I'm praying for, you know, children's ministry right now. I'm praying for churches that are still trying to recover from COVID. You do know that there are many churches that are still not meeting. I talked to a pastor of a large church in Third Ward recently. They're not coming back to church until the fall. They have too many seniors. And many in the community were not getting vaccines. Y'all, the church is changing. Are y'all going to talk back to me today? The times that we're in call for change. Y'all, 2020, the year, was a call for change. There's a study on um, how people accept and adapt to change. It's called the diffusion of innovation. The diffusion of of innovation. And it suggests um, in this theory that it, it seeks to explain how, why, and at what rate new ideas are accepted. And at what rate new ideas, new visions, even in the realm of technology, are either accepted 
or rejected. Watch this. First of all, you have what are called innovators. And only 2.5% of the population are innovators. Them the ones with the ideas. They're the ones that change culture, that change domains, that change wineskins, that change paradigms. Only 2.5% of the population, according to the study, are, are innovators. Only 13.5% are at the next level, which is what you call early adopters. They didn't innovate it, but 13.5% say, I can see that. I'm with it. I'm going to roll with that. I think that's going to be good. I think that's going to work. 34% are what's called the early majority. They're a little bit slower to adapt and to accept change, but they are nonetheless the early majority. That same number, 34%, comprises, according to the research, the late majority. Them the ones who say, I don't see it, I don't believe it, I'm not with it. I like how it used to be. Why come we can't go back to that? How come we can't do it the way we used to? I, I just, I just, I won't, I can't, I can't, I like, I don't, I just. Them the, them the, them the late majority. And then 16% are what we call the laggards, those who lag behind and they never catch on to change. I'm church tripping right now. What does that tell us? 34% late majority, 16% laggards. That tells us that 50% are late embracing and acting on change. My God, what if God decided to change something in your life? What if God decided to turn your world upside down for the better? Y'all ain't going to talk back to me. What if God wanted to change your relationships, change your career, change your atmosphere, change your economic status, change your knowledge level, change your educational level? What if God wanted to change your life? What if God wanted to change your church? 50% are slow or reluctant or rebellious at embracing and acting on change. Can I bring it home to the church? A lot of time, half the folk in the church don't want to change when God says change. I'm church tripping right now. Jesus says something powerful in John 13 and 35. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Somebody say church tripping. I'm going to be talking over the next couple of weeks about money in the church, false prophets and fake preachers, hypocrisy and immorality, and church hurt. Jesus says something I think is key that I want you to get. It's very vital. It's very important. It's very empowering. And I think it sets the theological foundation for church tripping and where the church needs to come out. I know We've been beefing with each other. I know the kids ministry don't like the ushers. I know the audio visual ministry don't like the praise team and the praise team don't like the camera crew and, and come on, and the preachers is beefing with, 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 with the missionaries. And I, I, I know that the enemy has brought us so far that the pastors and the apostles and the bishops and the teachers, we, listen, we, we, y'all, we've been tripping with each other. I'm talking to church leaders. I'm talking to church members. I know there's offense. I know there's questions. I know there's change that has happened. But here's what Jesus says as he's about to embark and implement and teach one of the biggest changes in his entire ministry. Jesus is about to be crucified. He announces after three years of doing ministry as a pedestrian pastor, as a ground-level pastor, he announces his disciples, I'm getting ready to leave. There's, there has to be a change in what we're doing. I know you don't want me to go. I know you're used to it the way that it used to be, but I got to change this thing because if I don't go to be with my father, then his spirit 
cannot rest within you. I got to go to prepare, to, to prepare a place. And they would, no, G, Rabbi, Jesus, it ain't so. Ain't nobody going to kill. We, we don't want this change. We don't, you listen, we, you know, all, all, all the drama, all of the, 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 the persecution, all of the division, the discord, the who's going to sit next to you in heaven, you know, who's going to be, who's going to have a place next to you, you know, all of the, 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 the who, who's stealing money out the treasury, who's going to betray you, all of that, all that church tripping Jesus. We, listen, we sorry. We just don't want you to change the ministry. We don't want you to leave here. And as Christ announces his departure, as he announces one of the greatest change in the journey with Jesus as they know it, he says this in verse 34. He says, the new commandment I give you. Y'all ain't heard this one. This is new. He says, the new commandment. I need y'all to catch this freedom family and all of my live stream viewers. He says, I'm giving you something new that I have not spoken to you before. I, I know you got the Ten Commandments. I know you have the Torah. I know you study all of the Levitical laws in order. He said, but I have a new commandment for you. Y'all get this. So simple, but so profound. He says, he says this, that you love one another. I don't need you in seminary if you can't love. I don't need you uh, on, the, on the ministry team if you can't love. I don't need you in the pulpit if you can't love. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Watch this. As I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Somebody type in the comments a new commandment. In the midst of change of Jesus' ministry, he says there's something that should never change, and that is love for one another. I can't get nobody to help me today. As the church is changing, in 2021, there's something that should never change, and that should be love for one another. Pastors should not stop. Help me, Holy Ghost. Pastors can't stop loving the sheep. Sheep can't stop loving their pastors. Come on, one another. Husbands can't stop loving their wives. I've seen some breakups during COVID. Wives can't stop loving their husbands, even though the husbands act cr cr crazy sometimes. Sisters can't stop loving their brothers. The church can't stop loving one another in the midst of change. The greatest decision, listen to me, that you can make in the midst of change is to decide to love others the way Jesus loves you. The greatest decision you can make in the midst of change, change happening all around, Jesus turning things upside down. Come on, shaking everything that is shakable. The greatest decision you can make in the midst of change, this is for somebody. The greatest choice, the greatest move, the greatest action you can take in the midst of change is decide to love one another, the same way Jesus loves you. A new commandment I give you. I'm changing this thing up. I'm changing up my ministry. I got to go away to prepare a place. But the greatest love, the greatest commandment, rather, I'm giving you this new commandment is a commandment to love. The top five things in the church that trip us up. Come on. Money in the church, we stop loving behind that. False prophets, fake preachers, we fall out of love behind that. Hypocrisy, immorality, we fall out of love behind that stuff. Church hurt, abuse, spiritual abuse, abandonment, neglect, confidentiality being broken, people talking about you, all these things represent church hurt. We fall out of love behind these things. And Jesus says, as I'm changing you, as I'm changing your life, as I'm changing the church, the greatest commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Y'all gonna pray with me today.
I want to deal really quickly with money in the church. It's a big issue. Um, lots of scriptures about money. God has a lot to say about money. But yet the enemy has so perverted and corrupted the subject of money, it's necessary to talk about money in the church. What they doing with the money? Why the preacher drive this or that? Why, 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 why? I want you to understand something about money in the church. Can I teach? I want you to understand that God has no problem with money. In fact, God does not have a problem with a church having money, nor does God have a problem with you having money. What God has a problem with is money having you. Well, you know, money is the root of all evil. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That ain't what the Bible verse says. The love of money is the root of all evil. Come here. Money is not evil. It's the love, the appetite, the desire, the lust. The love of money is the root of all evil. I'm going to say it again. God don't have a problem with the church being prosperous or having money. God don't have a problem with you being prosperous or having money. God has a problem with money having you. I'm going to prove it. Go back to understand and look at and embrace God's mindset about money in church. When you look at the first church, the first tabernacle, God used fine linen, expensive linen. He used rubies and jewels and gold to construct the early church. You had the tabernacle, which was made of fine linen, and then think about Solomon's temple, which pretty much extincted, uh, brought to extinction the tabernacle. When Solomon built the temple, y'all, gold, Marble, onyx, rubies, gems, jewels. We, we serve a God who don't have a problem with money in the church. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. We serve a God who adorned the tabernacle and the temple with the richest materials. I want you to understand money and the church from God's perspective. God told Haggai, Tell the people, my prophet, that I'm angry because their homes have wood panels, but the church of God lies in ruins. God had a problem with people having money, but the church being without. God always tested man's heart around money. He tested Abram, the father of our faith, around money. When Abram won his battle and came back with the power of God on him, who empowered him to win. Somebody say, God empowers us to win. Come on, somebody, somebody type in the comments, it's God who empowers us to win every battle. Abraham was acutely aware of this. And the first time we ever see, quote unquote, the kingdom and money exchanged, if you will, in the Bible, or, or man and the church in exchange of money was when Abram gave a tenth of his spoil to this deity God type called Melchizedek. God wanted to see early on, where is your heart? If I bless you, will you bless me? If I bless you, will you bless the church? I'm church tripping right now. Understand and embrace God's truth about church and money. God, God tested uh, the sons of Eli around money. They were stealing the offerings and having sex in the temple. They perverted the priestly position. God always tests man's heart around money. Certainly, there are a minority in the church who mishandle, abuse, stewardship, privileges, money management in the church, but I tell you, they are not the minority. Quit tripping off of the church and the money. God always tests man's heart. He tested Ananias and Sapphira and said, why, why, why all of us had pledged to give proceeds from land and real estate that we sold. Why did you all lie and steal from God and withhold your offering? He said they stole from God by withholding their money because God is a God who wants to know where your heart is concerning money. Quit listening to the 
ignorant, shallow people who told you about a preacher in a Cadillac. Stop listening to the ignorant, shallow folk who told you that a preacher stole some money. You was at a Chitlin church. You wasn't at a kingdom church. If you got preachers stealing money, you was at a Chitlin a hood church. You wasn't at a kingdom church. So you was at the wrong church in the first place if preachers are stealing the money and they don't have no systems of accounting and finances and accountability. You was at a Chitlin church, not a kingdom church. I said that. I'm church tripping. So it's your, it's your financial responsibility to make sure you're in a good church where you can trust issues around money. It's the church's financial responsibility to be good stewards, to be generous. Are you with me? I want you to understand when it comes to the church and money that God wants you blessed to be a blessing. As long as you have a negative mindset around church and money, you will always... Um, Opt yourself out of opportunity to be a tremendous kingdom blessing. As long as you operate under the menial midget mindset that, that, that somebody's trying to take something from you in the church, you will never position yourself for abundance and overflow. I want to give you a couple of keys that will unlock financial blessing uh, in your mindset about money. It's all about your mindset and how you view it. I need, I, I, I need you to erase everything that you've ever thought about church and money. And I want you to hear God speak to you from a proverb as he speaks to the young men and women as, uh, as, as Solomon writes these words. Proverbs 3 says this. Now, listen, I'm going to read to you uh, this entire passage. Um, I just have a few minutes left. It gives you nuggets on life in general, but it also gets to money. I want you to see how intent God is through his word on getting you blessed and prosperous. Somebody say, God is intent on seeing me blessed. Come on, say it again. Say, God is intent on seeing me blessed. Somebody type in the comments, he's trying to get it to me, not from me. Come on, come on. God is trying to get money and resources and blessing to me, not from me. Are y'all hearing me? Proverbs 3 and 9, or Proverbs 3 and 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace they will be added to you. He says the way to get peace and long life is to don't forget my law. Somebody say peace and long life. Jump down to verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Watch this. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Here's the blessing. Here's what he's trying to get to you. He says, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God. Listen, he, 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 first, he just got you some peace and, and, and lengthy life. Now, in verse four, he's giving you favor and high esteem. How do I get it, Pastor G? He says, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. Keep mercy and truth around your neck, and I'll give you favor and esteem. Jump down to verse 5. He says, truth in the Lord, or rather, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Here, God's trying to get you some peace. In verse 2, in verse 4, he's trying to get you some favor and some high esteem. In verse 6, he's trying to get you some direction. He says, all you got to do is trust me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Just give me my props. Acknowledge me in all your ways. And he says, I will direct your path. Seven minutes and I'm finished. He's trying to get you some peace. He's trying to get you some, some favor. He's trying to get you some direction. Look at verse 7 and 8. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Watch this. He says in departing from evil, here's what I'm trying to get to you. He says in, in, in you being humble, not being wise in your own eyes uh, and departing from evil, leave evil, run from evil, flee from evil, don't touch evil. Watch what he's giving you. He says it will be health to your flesh. Wish I had somebody. It'll be strength to your bones. In these passages, God just gave you length of days. He just gave you peace. He just gave you favor and high esteem. In verse 4, in verse 6, he just gave you direction. In verse 7 and 8, he just gave you health and strength. Now God finna get you some money. Are y'all ready for some money? 
Are you ready for God to give you some money? I'm talking church tripping because you was tripping on God and money. You tripping on the church and money. But here's what God wants to do for you. Verse 10, honor the Lord with what? All your possessions. And with the first fruits of all of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The Lord trying to get it to you, not from you. It don't matter who I give my tithe to, what they do with the tithe. It doesn't matter who I give my offering to. The scripture says it teaches me that I must honor God with all of my possessions. What does it mean to honor? It means to acknowledge and to esteem and to highly regard. How do I do that in practical application? It means that God says, I want your first fruit offering of everything that you get. If you want to enter, if you want to tap into a supernatural, divine economic relationship with me where I can take you from the ghetto, come on, to the penthouse, or I can take you from poverty to prosperity, if you really want to enter into divine exchange with me, he says, honor me with all your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. You get a check, give me the first fruits. You get a blessing, give me the first fruits. The scripture gives us 10% as a reference. It's a great place to start. It's a horrible place to finish. We should be giving much more than 10%. I give you $10 and I hand it to you and it give you the power to get it and you can't give me a dollar back and it belongs to me? He says, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow. Jesus says this in John 13 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my church. You are my followers. You are my ecclesia. You are my called out assembly. You are my holy nation. You are my royal priesthood. You are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm through church tripping about the church and money because now I have a pure mindset that if I'm at a church where I can't trust what's being done with the money, I need to pray about it if I'm in the right place. I need to be in churches that have demonstrated financial stewardship. I, I prophetically rebuke the lie that because churches are making moves to become economically sustainable, that church members are saying, oh, now they're all about the money. I rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus. I pray that eyes would be open, that scales would fall off, and that many would see what God is doing, even in the body of Christ, as he desires to economically and financially and spiritually and holistically and health-wise empower his people holistically. I'm going to say this apostolically, and I'm going to get up off the gas. I'm going to give an invitation. There's some things happening in Freedom Church right now that I'm so confident that are the will of God that there are many who have decided they don't want to be a part of it. It's not for them. You have those uh, early adopters. You have those innovators. What I said? You have those people who jump on early. Huh? You have those who uh, 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 decide that something they don't want to be a part of. They can't see it. Well, I, I like it the way it used to be. You got the late majority. You have the laggards. I'm telling you, keep on living and watch what God is doing in Freedom Church. Keep on living and watch what God is doing in our community. Keep on living and watch what God is doing through community works and through the box creative. Keep on living. It's going to, God, God is going to breathe, it's breathing right now on our ministry in such a prolific and profound way. It's going to be so attractive, you're going to regret that you left. You're going to regret that you didn't remain connected. 
I, it, it, is, it is a problem. Unless God got someplace else for you to be where you're supposed to be plugged in. Don't allow church tripping over some foolishness, some stuff that you really wasn't even informed of. You was just operating in your own understanding. Don't let that disconnect you from a great move of God and what God is doing. I'm so confident that the best place to be in the whole wide world is in the will of God. Type it in the comments. The safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. I, I, don't, I don't go to free and I, I don't do church. Well, are you in the will of God? Next week, I'll be talking about false prophets and fake preachers and immorality and hypocrisy in the church. I'm church tripping next couple of weeks. I hope y'all will join us. If you're here in live stream land and you're listening and you never made a decision for Christ, I want to invite you now. Jesus said, I know that you're mine when you love one another. He says, I'm giving you a new commandment, and maybe you're somebody who first needs a touch from Jesus. You want him to come into your life, come into your heart, come into your space, come into your realm, come into your home, come into your career, come into your thoughts. Tap the link in the comment. Pastor Gentry, I want to accept Jesus as Lord of my life. Maybe you want to join Freedom Church International. Tap the link in the comment. Let us rejoice with you about the decision that you've made to join Freedom Church. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I just need prayer. I need to rededicate my life. I need to get back on mission with God. I need to get back to my flow. I need to get back in church if that's you. And you're in Houston. You know what to do. Don't play with it. First and third Sundays. Every first and third Sunday. 7111 Homestead Road. Freedom Church International, rededicate, recommit, or get back to your church where you're supposed to be. I want to pray for you. Salvation, rededication, church membership. Father, in Jesus' name, we, 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 we're tired of church tripping. We're tired of leaning on our own understanding and trying to figure out what you're doing when you've already told us just to submit, just to go along with good leadership and go along with your vision and go along with the move of God. I pray for somebody who's struggling in sin right now or they're struggling in deception right now or they're struggling with indifference or they're struggling in mediocrity right now and they know that they're far from you. They know they should be closer to you. They know they should be walking with you, but something has taken over them, their thoughts, mediocrity, lackadaisical, indifference. I pray for them right now that you would touch them right where they are, snatch them into your loving arms and love on them and teach them to love others the way that you have loved them. I pray for souls to be saved. I pray for lives to be rededicated. I pray for Freedom Church to be added unto with new family members. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you to life. Johnny Gentry here. We threw, we threw church tripping. We ain't, we, we ain't worried about the money. We ain't banging about what was happening. We ain't banging about uh, where it's going. Be obedient. Honor the Lord with your first fruits. Get in a healthy church. Sow your money and watch God blow up your barns and your vineyards and your vats and watch your money overflow. I love you to life. See you soon. Live free. Good day, Free Indeed family. It's that time again. Time to bless the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Let's be sure to honor God with our first fruits of all of our increase. God has been so good. He's been amazing. And there is a reward for faithfulness, faithful tithes, offerings, um, and sacrificial giving. Sometimes I know it's very easy to get off track and forget to send our tithes. We're doing it digitally. We got websites. We got Cash App. We got text to give, so many ways to give. Just make sure you honor God. Your church needs your support. Uh, we need your financial push so we can continue to do the great work that we're doing for our church family, for our community, and for the kingdom. We love you so much. Happy giving.